everyone, uh, as this is going to be in English, uh, I'll speak in English as well. Uh, so, welcome to uh, the meeting with uh, Bruce Sterling. Uh, he's going to talk a bit in a minute. There will be a question and answer session, and uh, afterwards you can buy the book if you don't have it already and uh, have it signed. Okay, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Bruce Sterling. So are these my slides here? No. <laughs> these are somebody else's slides. Yeah, I, I knew I was going to need technical aid. I should have practiced that. <laughs> so I, I better sit here. Then. No, I can't. No, oh, I can use this guy. All right, so uh, thank you for showing up to see the foreign guy at your lovely literary event. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about science fiction, because I am a science fiction writer. But I want to talk about modern science fiction, things that are happening today. And I, I want to talk about spe specifically about science fiction with global characteristics, rather than national science fiction. Um, you know, normally literature is national literature, uh, a kind of secular religion, almost. And you would see people say, for instance, that they want to write the great American novel, which you would rarely hear about, say, the great English language novel, or the great global novel. But we nevertheless live in globalizing times, and that's starting to show up in the genre. So I want to acquaint you with some people who seem to me to be kind of trendsetters <coughs> along this way, that people in Estonia might find of interest. So this is gentleman number one here. And his name is uh, Hanu Ryan Yemi. He's a Finn. That's why I destroyed his name there. Hanu Ryan Yemi, born in 1978. He's a uh, science fiction writer who's getting quite well known in Britain. He, he's a physicist, but he lives in Edinburgh in Scotland, where he joined a group of science fiction writers. And he happened to get a very good literary agent and he's had a couple of very well-received uh, novels written, one called Quantum Thief, and then another one called Fractal Prince. So, you know, here you see this Baltic guy. I mean, he's not Estonian like you, but, but he is a Finn, and he's from a town that's even smaller than your town. His town has, like, got 14,000 people in it. Compared to his town, Tartu is like a metropolis. So, you know, he's kind of an existence proof of, uh, you know, a Baltic, at least, major league young science fiction writer who could be a big deal someday. He's an extremely intelligent guy, a mathematician, a physicist. He's, he's quite good with language. People say, oh, he writes in English. He's an exile. He doesn't write in Finnish. He does write in Finnish. It just nobody reads that but Finns. <laughs> And that's just how life is in a minority language. Whoop, let's see if I can go in the other direction. Nah, I'm getting there. Uh, 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 uh. This is a Windows machine. I hate those. OK, how do I move forward? If I click this guy, will that get me anywhere? It's going to be smaller. Yeah, right wing, right click. Yeah. Just close it and maybe see it. This is Windows, man. This thing is from hell. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yes, there's Hanu hanging out, doing something electronic better than I am. And this is uh, Lavi Tidar. I probably mispronounced his name, too. Lavi's an Israeli guy. But he's also this kind of globe-trotting exile character. He's lived in Britain and in South Africa. And he also lived in Laos, and he even spent quite a lot of time on a small South Pacific island. And then he returned to Israel, where he started putting together collections of international science fiction writers. He's the editor of a book called Apex Book of World Science Fiction. And he has a website called worldsf.wordpress.com, where he just sort of talks to people on the internet. He finds science fiction writers from all over the world, Mexico, South Africa, Laos, Ukraine, whatever. And he just sort of tries to publicize them. He's kind of a one-man 
crusader for global science fiction. He also writes novels. He's written two novels, one called Osama and one called Martian Sands. And here you see him at the World Fantasy Awards in the U.S., actually winning the World Fantasy Award for his novel Osama. There he is, walking off with the prize. He's a very interesting guy. He's born in 1976. Really loves a fight. You know, super controversial guy, Lavi Tidar. He's always flaming people, picking fights. He doesn't really have a budget, but he's, he's very good at attracting attention to himself, which can be very useful for a <clears throat> literary promoter. But he, too, is a very intelligent guy, and he certainly has more international friends than pretty much any editor or, you know, or writer that, that I'm aware of. The guy's kind of a one-man literary globalization machine. And uh, his blog's super interesting. I mean, I, I study it closely, and I'm, I'm always discovering science fiction writers in corners of the world that I, I know nothing about. Okay, I'm, I'm zooming in. So this is Lauren Bucus. Lauren Bucus, born in 1971. She's a South African writer. She has the good luck to write in English, although I think she also speaks Dutch, which a lot of people in South Africa do. She's uh, born in Pretoria, and has a, like a Dutch last name. She's currently living in Cape Town. And Lauren is, uh, well, she's a science fiction writer. She wrote a novel called Moxie Land, and then a second novel called Zoo City, and now she's written a, a, a horror novel, which is kind of a time travel stalker novel called Shining Birds, which is getting excellent reviews around the world. And she's somebody who just started from a region of the world, South Africa, which is by no means known for writing science fiction. And by getting published in Britain, she's actually becoming you know, a worldwide English language author. She started as a music journalist. And she's also worked in film, and she's done television, and she's done comics. Uh, you know, finally she got married, she had a child, she thought, you know, maybe I could write a novel. And she, like, wrote a novel, and it was a massive hit. So she's very talented, and rather a cyberpunk writer. And we cyberpunk writers really dote on Lauren. She think, we think it's really cute that there's a younger person in South Africa who's, like, super into cyber issues. So she's kind of our our, I don't know, our mascot. We, we really dote on her. Uh, and we're all on Twitter. She's, she's very big on Twitter. So, you know, the, the, being on Twitter is kind of a good thing for a contemporary writer, because Twitter is like the world's least annoying social network. And it's one where you can be really funny and entertaining in a very short period of time. So, I follow Lauren Bucus on Twitter, and I, I've learned many things about South African culture from her that I certainly would never have known without, without her friendship. And uh, you know, she could easily be a major figure. She's written three books. Each one of them is becoming more famous than the last. She's certainly the most famous South African science fiction writer there's ever been. And she's very contemporary, just now establishing herself in the world. So this is Cory Doctorow. Okay, Cory Doctorow probably doesn't need a lot of introduction. He's very famous on the network. He's an electronic civil liberties activist. He's very interested in intellectual property issues. He's a blogger for Boing Boing, you know, one of the best known sort of counterculture weblogs. He's written a whole bunch of books. Some of them have been pretty well received. Makers, Little Brother, his new book, Pirate Cinema, is doing very well. Born in 1971. You know, the reason that I single him out is that he's a Canadian-British-U.S. guy. Which, when you think about it, is really kind of an odd thing to be. I mean, he's, he is Canadian. He was born in Canada. His daughter was born in Los Angeles. His wife is British, and he used to spend a lot of her time in Japan. And now his daughter, who is Amer an American-born British-Canadian child in London. <laughs> You know, and, and he just handles all that very easily. I mean, he's a naturalized Briton. He seems to have sort of settled down in London, at least while the, while the child is young. But he's like really a, you know, a remarkably post-national guy. He's, he's just famous everywhere English is spoken. He's really famous everywhere the internet exists. But he's particularly famous uh, you know, in, in English language fiction circles. 
And you know, it's not unusual to be an American and move to Britain and establish a literary reputation. I mean, even T.S. Eliot did that. But it's really unusual to be a guy like Doctorow who really is Canadian and British and mostly famous in the U.S. And, and without really, in, without being a Canadian writer or a British writer or a U.S. writer, he just, he just doesn't have a national identification at all. And he, he, even his passport doesn't really have one. He's not, he's just not one. He's just a post-national literary figure. So, you know, what, what seems to be the trend here? Well, you know, science fiction is a form of fiction and literature tends to be very based on national language and sort of the proper treatment of language, but we do live in globalizing times. And it's just not the same science fiction world that it was 30 years ago. It's just, or you know, 70 years ago when science fiction got started. There really are new, new realities. And, People in the science fiction world are used to thinking of themselves as small. You know, it's like all over the world, I, I, I meet people from science fiction groups. And they always say, well, you know, we, we're here in our country, but we're sort of barely hanging on. There's only like 500 of us, and our country's very small, and we're kind of little known, and we see ourselves as unusual and kind of picked on and weak and, you know, not really literary and somehow not part of the mainstream publishing world. But, you know, the reality is that J.K. Rowling, who wrote these fantasy novels about this boy wizard in the magic school, is the richest and best published woman who ever wrote in Britain. She's the best-selling British author there's ever been. She sold 400 million books around the world. Just a colossal number of books. A vast number of books. I mean, a far vaster number of books than any rival British writer, male or female. And then there's Stephanie Meyer, who wrote romance, paranormal romance books, about romances with vampires, you know, which would seem like a very narrow genre thing to book. She sold 100 million of those. 100 million of those. You know, it's not that women who write fantasy novels are somehow eccentric figures. On the contrary, they make more money than anybody else in publishing. You know, the rest of the publishing world is actually held up by romance and magic fiction. They're just vastly better selling than the others. You know, you know, and even a guy like George Martin, who really is a career male science fiction writer of the old school, he's the guy who wrote Game of Thrones. He's got a massive international hit with his TV series. It's like pirated all over the world as a fanatical fandom for this Game of Thrones thing. It's big in every nation on earth that's got a television. It's just colossally huge. Now, that doesn't mean that you become colossally huge here in Estonia. It just means that as people who are part of kind of global science fiction, you're part of something that's very, very big. It's not super powerful influentially, and it, it, you know, and it kind of has a chip on its shoulder, but it's not a small thing in literature. On the contrary, science fiction and, and romance fantasies probably ought to be apologizing to other forms of literature for just really stealing all their readers and kind of all their, all their money. I mean, they're just much, much, much bigger. And, you know, that's the reality. So, you know, please don't feel sorry for yourself. Right? I mean, there's a, there's a kind of arrogance in that. You're actually, you're a, you're a regional group, but you're attached to something that is very huge. Now, of course, these two women happen to be English language writers. And actually, it's kind of the structure of contemporary publishing that has allowed them to sell 400 million books and 100 million books. You know, the English language publishing is in a lot of trouble, and they try to to go for sort of super hit blockbuster books while eliminating the mid list. And that's kind of a problem. But 
it's not really a problem for Estonian writing because the, the relative collapse of English language publishing actually empowers people in other languages. And in the long run, people in the U.S. are only 4% of the planet's population. They happen to have all the big technologies, or they did for a while, but they won't forever. And they're just not that important in the long run because there's just not that many of them. So, you know, who do I sort of consider the trend spotters here? Well, you know, it's not really Stephanie or JK, even though I don't really have a problem with them. I'm happy to see them earn hundreds of millions. I think that's kind of great. And their books are better than people say. But what really interests me are guys like this guy. This is Orhan Pamuk, who's, you know, he's the Turkish writer, won the Nobel recently. He writes, he's pretty clearly a fantasy writer. If you go and read some of earlier, well, Pomuk's early works, pa, you know, White Castle, Black Book, and so forth, they're quite Kafka-esque. They're very anti-realistic. They're really literary fantasies. Impossible things happen in them. Okay, this guy's a genuinely important world literary figure. <clears throat> he won the Nobel. He's politically significant in, in Turkey. There's a culture war against him. He's struggling for free expression. He's super popular in Turkey. You know, he's a beloved figure in the, in the Muslim world. He was born in uh, uh, 1952. But, you know, he's, he's a guy who is unquestionably one of the major literary figures of our time, who also writes fantasy works, and writes them from Turkey, you know, an area which is not really well known for literary fantasy. Very important guy. You know, and his books are good. And he also writes uh, journalism and other things. I mean, he's even done a movie, and he got so rich he even started his own museum. He's just a really interesting guy to follow. Nobody calls him a sci-fi writer or a fantasy writer, but he's, he's pretty much one of us. And here's Haruki Murakami, internationally famous Japanese voice of his generation, born in 1949, translator of Kurt Vonnegut, the science fiction writer, translator of Richard Brautigan, the poet. He's written all kinds of fantastic work. IQ 84, really a sci-fi book. Wind Up Bird Chronicles, Dance, Dance, Dance. Impossible things happen in his works. They're, they're, too, they're also very fantastic. He's a traveler. He's lived in many different countries in the world, speaks several languages, translates other people's writing. He's a journalist, he does nonfiction. He'll get the Nobel sooner or later if he can stay, stay alive long enough. He's, you know, he's a very important literary figure and a guy who's really kind of just a major literateur who's somebody who's, whose sensibility is very much like ours. You know, he doesn't call himself a science fiction person, but then again, you can read him as a science fiction fan and derive a lot of benefit from it. So, you know, what's going to happen? Well, you know, my, my feeling is that eventually we're going to see somebody write a regional novel about the whole planet. Eventually we're going to see an actual global novel written. But that's probably going to take another generation. Somebody's just going to realize that the Earth is a small place and they're just going to write a book which is about the Earth and the way that like an Estonian writer can write about Estonia. It's just a small place and it's got sort of some issues and it's not beyond literature to just write global work about the globe for a global audience. But nobody really knows how to go there or what to do. Uh, but I think that's inevitable and given that it's sort of inevitable, I think people ought to try to help. So, you know, in conclusion, I'm going to show you a few things here, a couple of things anyway. I don't think we can rely on the publishing industry to do this for us, even though there are people who are translators and I'm very happy to have my book in your language and so forth. You know, the publishing industry really isn't going to help authors reach this goal. It's really a cultural problem. It's not a business problem. So what you really sort of have to do is not wait for books to do it for you, but try to take some kind of direct action across cultural boundaries. Something like this, which is a, this book is called uh, Three Messages and a Warning. And it's a small press book from Texas, which is a collection of Mexican science fiction stories. 
Now, between America and Mexico, I mean, you know, of course, Mexican Nobel Prize winners get published all the time, but it's actually rather rare for Mexican science fiction writers to get published in the U.S., and even vice versa. And in Texas, which is on the Mexican border, we've been keenly aware of this for a long time. And we struggled and struggled to find some commercial way to actually get our Mexican friends across the border into our language where they could be heard. And it finally took this guy, Chris, Christopher Brown, who's the editor of this book. He happens to speak Spanish. He just went into Mexico. He started befriending these guys. He went to their science fiction events. He talked to them. They went out drinking together. They learned all kinds of things. And finally, he just became an entrepreneur. And he put this book together, and I wrote the introduction for it. And it's not because we asked anybody in publishing to do it. It was because we actually just got in the car or the plane, and we just went over there, and we just sat down with them. And I was like, okay, we write science fiction, you write science fiction, you write ciencia ficción. In Mexico, they write CF, they don't write SF. But you write this stuff in what seems to be the issue, and you know, we really had some interesting discussions. And now they're working on a book, which is a book of science fiction by Americans set in Mexico, to be published in Mexico. They're Mexican-themed science fiction stories by Americans to be translated into Spanish and published in Mexico. This book hasn't occurred yet. I wrote a story for it. I think it's one of my better stories. But what I'm really happy about it is this kind of, this kind of international gesture where you don't just like talk about literature, but actually just, you know, take direct action. I mean, just like go and sit in their laps. Marry them if you have to. And then there's this other book here, which would be kind of familiar to you Estonians. You know, I've been looking at your books, you know, the ones that are published here, and they reminded me very much of this book and the way they're sort of handled and put together. This is an uh, Italian language book, which was written by myself and my wife Yasmina. Uh, because we're columnists for an Italian newspaper. So here's this book, which is written by an American and a Serb who live in Torino in Italy. And it's all about Torino. And it's specifically sold to Turinese tourists. Foreigners who come to Turin and have never been to Turin buy this book because it's about being a foreigner in Turin. If you follow me. Right? Yeah, it's just, you know, it's just a kind of strange, like, globalized foreigner's guidebook. It's like, hi, we're foreigners, and you're foreigners, and we're going to tell you about this place, because, you know, we sort of have that in common. But, you know, it's just a very small press book. In fact, it's a super regional book. You know, Turin is like, I don't know, it's the size of Riga. But, you know, nevertheless, it's sort of like very worth doing, and I'm sort of, like, you know, absurdly proud of this little book. It even has, like, a comic book in it where the wife and I are kind of walking around disguised as Italian comic book figures. You know, it's not a huge selling book, but it's kind of a significant cultural gesture. It's like actually doing something as opposed to just sort of being a tourist in a foreign milieu. And it doesn't reduce everybody to some equal status. It's actually just kind of a thing that's true about the way we actually live now. You know, and and it's, a step to, it's a step to something else and something better. So, you know, what are you to do if you're an Estonian science fiction person and you'd like to be better there or somewhere else? Well, the first thing to understand is that your situation is shared by many, many other people in similar situations. And you kind of need to get friendly with them. I mean, forget about getting friendly with the U.S. publishing business. It's in collapse. I mean, yes, they can make you into J.K. Rowling. Yes, they can make you into Stephanie Meyer. But it's about as, as plausible as you writing a hit movie. What you really need to do is try to understand what you have to comment in the Czech Republic, or Venezuela, or Croatia or New Zealand, you know, and the immediate question is like, well, I'm from Estonia, why do I care about New Zealand? Well, you know, why do they care about you? 
If you don't care about them, they're not going to care about you. If you actually do care about them and you go and like involve yourselves in their lives, you might learn something really interesting. And you might in, find, in fact find that they have some kind of solution that you didn't know was there and it's now becoming an easy thing to do. I mean, real globalization isn't about Paris talking to New York or London talking to Moscow. It's really all about Latvia talking to Mozambique. It's all about Argentina talking to Kazakhstan. You know, and if we ever get to a world where somebody can write global literature, it's going to be a world in which that's the reality. If it was easy to do, somebody would have done it already. But we have to have the faith to take what concrete steps we can do. You can't just wish and dream. You actually have to do something concrete, even if it's a small thing that doesn't seem to matter. Now, over a long period, these are the steps that will get us where we need to go. So thank you for your attention.